that's this is the kind of thing that the uh, uh, our foundation uh, is always looking for equipment for the things to, to help hospitals and people. Uh, all right, so that I mean, we took your number one there. Um, this is something that more and more we find um, helpful. You know, the latest edition of NRP really pushes simulation. And everybody looks at simulating, you know, a baby that comes out and you have to do resuscitation. But simulation um, lends itself to everything. And, um, for instance, we um, go up and simulate um, high-risk delivery in our high-risk obstetric unit. And when we did that a couple years ago, using a um, um, mannequin um, that we took up in the well, uh, found that if a mom delivers in the bathroom in a couple of our high-risk rooms and the bathroom door is open, it blocks the door from the room being able to be open. So this mom, if, she, if a real mom had delivered in the bathroom, she would have had to crawl to the front of her room with the baby to open the door so the staff could get in to help her. And so there's nothing that, that simulation doesn't help you get the bugs out of. Um, one of the big things we found when we were doing NRP simulation is that in our big, busy NICU, none of our code cards were, cards were the same. And they were all oriented differently, stocked differently. Now every code card in women's hospital for babies looks the same. Uh, but we found that with our NRP simulation that, that, that was really variable. Um, the, uh, the other um, couple months ago, I had to cardiovert a baby in the middle of the night. Our cardioverter hadn't been used in a couple of years. And none of the neos that were around had used it. The cardiologist was at home saying, oh, it's no problem. Just turn it on and do this. And the cardioverter he knew was not the cardioverter we had in the NICU. And so fortunately, the nurse practitioner on call with me was a former charge nurse in the unit. So she knew the cardioverter because she was a charge nurse. She had to check it every, every shift. Uh, but you know, should we practice that? Yeah. respiratory distress in newborns that you'd like to talk about. Are there particular... How long do you... You've got a baby under the oxygen. How long do you give that baby before you try to start weaning them? Okay. Um, well, that's going to be related to how the baby looks and what their saturation is run. respiratory distress is getting better and their saturation is good to high, then you can start weaning them as soon as they look better. And their saturation is good. And how quickly do you do that? Do you turn it down 10% and wait 5 minutes or an hour? Or? I think you just start slowly and as they tolerate it, go faster if they look like they're fine. Um, you know, but 5 or 10% to start with if their sats, you know, high 90s, 100. That's fine. And then uh, um, you can uh, go faster or slower as they tell you. But what I like to do in babies that are at risk for persistent pulmonary hypertension, which is your term and near term kids, then I like to get their SATs into the upper 90s, 100, and have them 
have it be there for a little bit before I start leaving. Um, but you know, that little bit you know, is, depends on how they look too. If they're still working a little hard, I'm going to wean them a little slower than if they really look fine. problem here with a baby that's going bad, um, it's that half hour till somebody gets here yep. and what to do, you know, not intending. And if they're not at the place where you need to bag mask them, but I think if we had something like a vapor burn that we could put a little oxygen on with a little bit of pressure, you know, knowing how to, to use it correctly, can hold most of our kids that we have had over, but instead we end up kind of watching them suck mud for a while until somebody gets here, which is kind of, um, you know, I've thrown around the idea that we start, you know, like some kind of bubble CPAP or something like that, which, you know, for a place like this, but, you know, in that entry until, you know, somebody can get here, and it's, we're not a 24-7 operation with respiratory here, you know, which kind of creates a problem although we're on call. And, we live close, but um, those are some of the issues I think we hear go against, you know, knowing what you know, level we are and we really can't keep CPAP and things like that. You know, and if we had, you know, vapor therm isn't really classified under CPAP, so you know, we, could, we could probably get by with that to hold some of these babies over until um, somebody got here, right? I think that would. So I think probably what I would suggest those and, and what I have seen is um, in several places that the vapotherm fails as a stabilization support and that we get there and they're giving mask CPAP through the neopon. And probably the best bang for the buck would be neopon. Um, and uh, um, because again if you're using it right you get limited positive pressure from the neopon. Um, the vapor if, if you're doing the needle puff part, you're using it in the CPAP, but in the wrong hands, the needle puff can well, be detrimental too because you control it with your thumb. And right, and just all this. Blow along. That, that's the only thing about needle puff that I worry about. Because, yeah, because, you know, you get. And people, when you're in a situation, you know, once you're trained to do it, get. You know, you put your thumb down, you hold it, you pull it up, or you're not, you know, you're not doing it as quickly as what a baby needs, you know. It's hard to get a point for a lot of time. <laughs> but that just goes back to practicing the yeah. use of it and, and, and using it correctly. And that, um, you know, if you're looking at things that are going to help you with NRP, as well as stabilizing a really sick kid till the transport team arrives, then again, I think probably you're talking about The pro another problem with, um, again, as I alluded to this before, with the vapor therm is people get the lull into a false sense of security because it's so easy to use and end up with babies sitting around longer than they should and getting sicker on it. And, um, and unfortunately, I've been on the receiving end of several transports where the kids have been on vapor therm. they got worse and and I, that's not a failure of vapotherm that was a failure of this baby the kids I picked up have been like 36 hours old where they've been on neopuff for like you know 12 16 18 hours that the babies really weren't doing what they were giving them signals that they weren't getting better and they probably should have been out of there before but I think that um, you know, I think you all need to talk with your physicians about, um, you know, what you would like to do. But my suggestion would be is you at least need to get a needle puff, an 
and see how it is. You're not going to need it very often, and then you can probably cover more bases with a needle puff or two than you can with having the vapor thermal. Um, but that um, and the needle puff is, you know, something like that is endorsed and suggested by the NRP, and that's probably the first thing to take care of. But you do have to learn how to use it, and there's nothing we use that you don't you know, have to learn how to use it. And you will have the disadvantage of hopefully you don't need the needle puff more than you know, a half dozen times a year. Um, but it is pretty easy to use, um, and uh, um, but you do have to practice it a little bit. What do the physicians think that are? Listening. <laughs> <coughs> getting a LMA for kid? Yeah. LMA for sure. It's far down, and that's another thing you have to do. You know, you can you know, turn the bag through it or hook it to the needle pump. And some training how to use it. Yes. Yeah. Which we would gladly come up and help you with. I would say that, you know, our, um, in surgery, we don't do young kids. So we've not needed the laryngeal, mat, laryngeal masks for that size. And um, I'm not familiar with the laryngeal mask anyway. You probably are. Have you used it on newborns? Just on mannequins. I've never had the need okay. to use it on yeah. It's just one of those things that you probably ought to have around since it's suggested by NRP. We don't use them very often. We've used them a couple You'll of times. You'll use ET tubes then? ET tubes or, um, you know, that, that's just what we go to because we have that. Mm -hmm. um, but anesthesia, our pediatric anesthesia uses them in the OR occasionally on the babies as well as kids. And we'll bring them back and just use that instead of anything. Now, apparently there was something about cuffed anesthesia tubes. That's just for longer term. Yeah, Ventilatory support, or do you ever use cuff? We never use a cuff. Because there was something about, I know the, the anesthesiologists, and there's something about using cuff anesthesia tubes for everybody, or something like this. Are you getting any kind of, you know, They will uh, occasionally bring back? us back a cuff DT tube, but that's usually on an older, bigger baby. Okay. If they bring it back to us on a regular size term newborn who's not very old, or a preemie, we never use the cuff. And actually, we we take those out and put a new ET tube in because the cuff tubes don't work with our ET tube holders that, that we put on every baby. So, but no, um, people, neonatologists don't use cuff tubes just because um, we like a leak, a little bit of a leak. It, it's, it's hard on the, uh, the infant airway. Um, when they get a little older, that's fine. You know, when we have these preemies that are, or these kids that have been with us that are on a ventilator and they're four months old, you know, then, then we'll use a cuff tube for a little bigger airways, a little firmer. <coughs> cuffed on some of the older mm -hmm. kids. Yeah, we do that. We just cuffed okay. on older babies. Yeah. yeah, I'm talking just in the neonatal period. That's, yeah. that's what I'm talking about. We don't ever use a cuff. <coughs> Have you used? Laryngeal masks on babies, or is that usually anesthesia? That's usually anesthesia. But okay. A couple of my partners have used that. So you're, you're most comfortable with ET tubes yeah. when you need that kind of ventilatory support? Yep. Yeah. Okay. They, usually, they usually don't need to. Yeah. <laughs> they can get them in. Yes. <laughs> but we use, you know, 